Okay, I guess we'll start the introduction as people kind of start to come in. Uh, hello, welcome to today's Tiger webinar. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you and our entire Tiger family are doing well during these ever-changing times. Hopefully everyone saw our email about the launch of Tigers Connect, our new platform that allows students to reach out to alumni for mentoring opportunities and for alumni to connect with one another. Students will be invited to join at the end of September, and if you haven't signed up yet, we encourage you to do so by visiting tigersconnect.rit.edu. We also hope that everybody will connect to the Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, where you find up-to-date communications and opportunities about what's happening at RIT. To view our social media channels, please click click the link in the chat box. You can access the chat box by clicking on the chat icon on the right-hand side of the webinar window. We wanna take a moment to thank the many exceptional alumni that have reached out to us during the pandemic, asking how they could help our students in the university during these unprecedented times. If you'd like to contribute to the areas of greatest need, scholarships, or any fund of your choice, please visit the RIT website in order to give and donate today. Now let's go over a few housekeeping rules first to help you enjoy today's presentation. If you're joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the webinar transmission. Don't worry, the webinar platform is secure and does not require VPN access. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions for our panel can be entered into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen at any time throughout the discussion. We'll make every effort to address all of your comments and questions throughout the webinar. Live captioning is also being provided and are found via the link located, sorry, live captioning is also provided and can be found using the closed captioning button at the bottom of your window. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we'll do our best to get you the appropriate answers. Now on to our webinar. We're happy to welcome RIT alumnus, Jesse Gage. Jesse is an NYC-based performer, songwriter, and musical theory writer. His television credits include Fox, NBC, BBC, PBS, and a bevy of Brazilian soap operas. After discovering musical theater and writing the cult hit Oklahoma, Enforcer of Justice, he was awarded a musical theater fellowship at NYU Tisch and in 2016 and 2017 was recognized by Barrington Stages as one of the ridiculously talented writers you should know, but probably don't. Most recently, his musical Simon and Jorge Pay the, Their Student Loans was a selection of the 2019 National Alliance for Musical Theater New Works Festival. It was subsequently optioned for Broadway and is now being developed as an animated episodic comedy. In addition to his creative pursuits, Jesse works as a corporate telecommunications attorney and is a member of the federal New York and Massachusetts bar. He lives in Coney Island with his amazing wife, Marlena, and son, Jonah Blue. Let's turn it over to Jesse. Jesse, the audience is all yours. Great. Well, thanks, Ron. I appreciate that. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be back at RIT. Uh, definitely did not expect that my songwriting and musical theater writing would be the route that brought me back here. So that was a bit unexpected, uh, to say the least. But you know, I thought it's also actually a great um, segue into kind of what I guess would be the theme of my story here today and kind of how I've ended up at this point in my life. It's full of those unexpected connections and turns and twists. Um, <clears throat> So about, yeah, I mean, how I ended up at this point, I, I, uh, I'd always wanted to be a lawyer since I was a little kid. And so I went, came to RIT for my undergraduate uh, studies and then went straight through law school and um, got out and I was practicing law by around 23, 24 years old. And, uh, you know, for the first year or so, I, I loved it. Uh, I was working behind a desk, getting direct deposit, getting paid, uh, not working manual labor or bartending or waiting tables. And yeah, for a year or so, it was seemed like the, the kind of living the dream, so to say. Um, but as, uh, as about a year into it, I started to kind of feel like something was missing. I was just not finding maybe the passion that I thought I, I needed to. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me that maybe this wasn't uh, the life 
that I wanted to live, or it wasn't the only life I wanted to live, I should say. Um, and you know, I thought about it, maybe it's possible to um, you know, have different tracks in life simultaneously and, and go on different pursuits. So I decided to start uh, returning to a, a passion of mine as a child, which was um, writing music and um, my secret aspirations of being a rock and roller, uh, which I'd never told anyone about. And uh, I'd never, you know, admitted to my family or friends that I was kind of writing songs. I played piano and guitar as a child. And so I had this kind of hidden interest. And um, so at that point, I decided, all right, I'm going to figure out how to write a song. And I spent the next four or five years literally in a basement uh, in quiet rooms where no one could hear me, uh, trying to figure out how to how to create music. Um, you know, even my my girlfriend at the time was now my wife. We were living together in, in Queens, New York, and I wouldn't even play the songs for her. This went on for years. Uh, yeah, like I said, almost four to five years. And finally, she had had enough. And she told me, just play me the play the damn songs. Let me just hear them. Uh, so I finally I got up the courage. I played a few songs for her. And, um, you know, and she was pretty, pretty generous in, <laughs> in her response. And she's uh, a, you know, a generally honest person. So I thought, all right, well, she didn't hate them. Um, and then the next stage, of course, was to get out and perform, which was just, I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do less than, than get on stage by myself and sing these songs for people. Uh, it just made no sense to me. So once again, she prodded me and pushed me and I went into, uh, did an open mic night. Um, that, you know, this, it was in the city and you, you get your number at like nine at night. And my number was 97. So I was there until one, one thirty in the morning trying to leave. She would push me back in. I don't exaggerate. This was really happening. And finally got up there and played my two songs and got a pretty good response. Uh, and so I got done with that, sent out some demos to other clubs around the city and um, started getting calls back, you know, looking to book a gig which I was half hoping wouldn't happen, I think, uh, just because I couldn't imagine getting up there for you know 45 minutes or an hour and uh, putting myself out there like that. So sure enough, the first uh, callback was a place called uh, Acme Underground on Great Jones Street in the village. And I went in with my guitar and uh, a piano keyboard and and yeah, I thought I was just gonna puke all over the place. I was so nervous and petrified and every cell in my body was telling me don't do this <laughs> do not go up there but of course it was too late because at that point you know people were there and I had to do it so I, I I got through the performance and uh it was just terrible I mean I I mean the performance itself wasn't terrible but for me personally it was just a devastatingly frightful experience I I, I got done and was sure I would never do that again I could not imagine repeating that experience over and over again, which is obviously what you do when you play out. Um, but some more of the bars and clubs um, called to book gigs. So I <laughs> just dragged myself out there and made myself do it because I loved creating and I loved writing. And I thought, well, maybe eventually performing will, will start to become also enjoyable. And, um, and it did, you know, I, I was, uh, starting to play every month or so around the city. I, I um, ended up hooking up with a kind of a small time manager who, uh, who helped me put together a band. He recruited some players. Because at the time I was actually playing with a record player using for my backing tracks. I found a place that made one-off um, records in Oregon. And they, so they put down some of these tracks I made and I was just playing along to that. Which, which was kind of cool and got some uh, some positive feedback. So this guy helped me put together a band. Um, <laughs> as a side note, he was he was a character, and it turned out he was suffering from lead poisoning unknowingly, and uh, he was losing his mind a little bit. And after about six months of playing with the band, he comes up to me one night. He's like, "Jesse, when did you get, when did you get a guitar player?" And I was like, "I we've had a guitar player from the beginning." And, he, and that's when I realized something was not right with this guy, even though he was he was doing, you know, a good, he was working hard to get us out there. 
Uh, and he actually ended up really booking some great gigs for us. We, we started doing weekly residencies at um, a place called the Whiskey Bar in Hoboken, New Jersey. And then he got us another weekly residency at a, a really great club called Red Line on Bleecker Street in the village. And then another one at a, at a place on McDougal. So I was out there and I had finally overcome this like just frozen fear of, of performing. And it was really becoming um, second nature almost. And I was having fun, the band was having fun. And, um, and we were starting to gain a following. Uh, and so at, at a certain point, the drummer, uh, Craig and I, who was really, the two of us were kind of the heart of the, of the band decided, all right, let's take it. We, we were trying to get people in off the streets to keep you know filling up the clubs we were playing. And we realized, why don't we just take it to the streets? And uh, we, again, it seemed like kind of a reckless uh, plan that I didn't want to do. <laughs> and he didn't particularly want to do, but both of us thought it could be uh, a good experience. So we decided to take the show to Washington Square Park in the village and play under the big arch, if anyone knows Washington Square Park. So I wheeled out my piano, which was like a 64 key acoustic, weighed 250, 300 pounds. Um, he brought out a modified drum kit with his kick drum, a snare and a hi-hat. And we set up under the arch and um, it, it was, you know, it killed. We were, we were out there, honestly, we were averaging about a hundred bucks an hour playing out there. Uh, and we sold thousands of CDs and um, it turned out to just be a phenomenal experience. Um, and actually there are a few video clips uh, I have to share. Um, during the presentation. And this is the first one. Um, this was, there's a documentary filmmaker who saw us and decided to make a short film about us and also uh, made this music video for us. And um, so this is a song called Weight of the World. And this is us playing Washington Square Park. <laughs>
yeah, so that's, <clears throat> it's always funny watching it back. It's a blast from the past. Uh, so we, um, things started to take off from there. I mean, we started, <laughs> it's funny, we were kind of like local celebrities in the village. People would shout us out. And I remember walking by uh, the Highline actually at one point, which is a park on the west side. And uh, there were postcards and one of them was of, of me playing the piano. <laughs> I was laughing when I came up to him. Um, so that playing the park and playing those gigs, um, we ended up meeting up with a whole uh, rep team of representation that picked me up as we, so we got a new manager through this uh, who did not have lead poisoning. Um, we, uh, uh, when I say we, there, it was I really, they, uh, uh, an agent, a lawyer, a producer. And this is a team that had gotten deals from Maroon 5, John Mayer, um, Rihanna had produced some of their stuff her stuff, uh, Enrique Iglesias, like a whole slew of, of pretty big acts. And so they signed me up. Uh, we went into the studio, recorded some demos uh, professionally. And um, they started sending it around to labels. And you know, they were getting a phenomenal response. Uh, I had a call from my agent uh, when I was, meanwhile, I've been working as a lawyer still. <laughs> not probably as dedicated as I should have been, but I was getting the job done. And uh, I got a call from my agent saying eight labels wanted private showcases. They loved the music. Uh, he had just gotten a deal for a similar singer songwriter about six months earlier, a million dollar advance. And he's like, man, I'm telling you, this is it. You'll be able to quit your job soon. And um, I was pretty psyched. It definitely looked like everything was coming together. And we did the showcase. It was great. Uh, we we uh, didn't do private showcases. The showcase is when you have the labels and all their a &R people come out and they see you live and see if you can do what you do on the recording. And that went well. And, um, and it looked like everything was going to fall into place. And then it just all fell apart. And it didn't. Um, this was the time that, uh, believe it or not, when music was not yet on digital format, um, and Napster had just kind of hit and the and digital was starting to take over and, and the labels were getting crushed. Their bottom line was getting crushed. They were losing tons of revenue from everything that was going on. And these AR groups were just getting fired one by one. I think I had the shortest record deal in history. Uh, and before I knew it, um, the whole kind of the whole ship crashed and I was back where I started uh, by myself, um, which is understandable. You know, I mean, these people have obviously a, a living to make and when it looks like it's not gonna work out, they move on to the next next opportunity. And the band kind of, you know, as the classic story goes, started to drift apart once those successes didn't uh, materialize. And I was left at a kind of another crossroads, um, figure out what to do. And uh, once again, it was my better half, my, my uh, wife, who was still the girlfriend at the time, was, uh, you know, I had been talking about just maybe I'll go out and do this and hit the road. Let me, let me try that. And so she was, get that van, go get your van, get the piano ready, and, and you have my blessing to, uh, to, to go out and try this. So I went and bought a red sprinter van used. and. Um, I re redid the interior so I could live out of it. I got a, a big old white 88 key piano, full size of course, went to, brought the piano into an auto body shop and they welded on four wheels onto the bottom. I put a, a, a wheelchair ramp and a power winch in the van. And then um, I hit the road. I left Brooklyn, left my, my, uh, my lovely girlfriend and our, our two dogs. And I just said, I was gonna make this happen one way or the other. And so I, um, I toured the East Coast for about six months, trucking around, uh, wheeling my piano around the streets and in and out of bars. And that brings us to the next video clip. Uh, this one, I was not so lucky to have a documentary filmmaker uh, on board. This one I just shot on my own. Uh, so this is called Trying to Fly.
fight for the truth If I knew I would lose, I don't Yes, and so that was the band chapter of my life, and um, and also kind of introduced me to a new a newfound kind of passion and path of of making films and making videos. So um, once again, you know, kind of a, the twists and turns create these opportunities and learning experiences that you know ultimately I you know, have uh, added to my overall kind of creative endeavors, um, and and it was it was a challenging experience to go out there and do that. Um, you know, after a number of months, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I, I was uh, in my early thirties at that point and um, I was missing, missing home. Uh, and I was frustrated. It wasn't really panning out in terms of creating any traction, getting any interest. I was playing some clubs and meeting a lot of cool people. And it was, <laughs> it was some wacky times for sure. But um, there was, it was not getting me anywhere um, at, for, as far as a career. So I bagged it. I, uh, I, I went back to Brooklyn, sold the van, and was happy to be home, sleeping in my bed with my, uh, my, my girlfriend and dogs. And uh, I was sure that was it. I'd given my best efforts at making a, a career in the arts and, and music. And um, I decided I was just gonna settle down and be a lawyer and find my passion in that. Um, and that lasted, you know, for about a year. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was probably the longest stretch I'd gone in 10 years or more where I was not doing anything creative. Um, and I could feel it was starting to kind of uh, crush my soul a, a little bit. And, uh, and then the unexpected happened. We unintentionally, and uh, yeah, surprisingly, we made a baby, which we were not planning on doing. Uh, and so that, you know, obviously changed a lot for me. And I guess some people have a baby and it, it makes them want to be more responsible. Uh, but in my case, 
I, you know, I thought I, I want him, my son to um, see that side of me. You know, I didn't want him to just not know that I, I had this whole other life and this whole other passion um, that, that I believed in. So it, uh, once again, you know, the bug was biting me and I, I decided to, I needed to do something. So I, I started by just writing songs again. And uh, this was one that I did, uh, one of the first ones I did for uh, my son. Um, and it was called Merry Christmas, Jonah Blue. And it was also one of the first songs I did uh, as a collaboration um, where I wrote lyrics. And uh, there was a, a composer who I knew who wrote the music and which was an experience that um, later on became very useful. And uh, there we go. Sorry, I might be a little ahead of the program on this. The lights are nicely hung, just like your dear old dad. Sorry you're too young, don't tell mom she'll just get mad. What I'm trying to say, my strange way from me to you, is Merry Christmas, Joan. Give you my mistakes Like my father did before And pray for what it takes To give you something more And I'll never know why Some say goodbye I'll never tell you Merry Christmas Jonah Blue And when months turn to you boxes to beers and the hair grows thick in my ears I'll smile through all of the tears think about this and laughing at all that your wet sloppy kiss and your Thomas the train and the way every day you just come out and say, Daddy, I love you. Well, I love you too. Merry Christmas, Joan Blue. Maybe I should have added a black box over that last one. <laughs> As you can see, I, comedy has certainly uh, built into my creative DNA a bit. Um, and so that kind of reignited the spark to just keep on keeping on and just trying to, whether it be for personal gains or commercial gains or whatever, I, I, I realized then that I'll just always have to create. It's just something I do. Um, and so I started trying to figure out how, what, what do you do when you hit middle age and you can't be a rock and roller. And uh, obviously I'm way too old for record labels at that point. And um, I got thinking back to an experience I had going back to um, September 11th, 2001, uh, the September 11th. Um, I was working uh, downtown in Manhattan and uh, at Liberty Plaza, which is right across the street from the trade centers, or was. And luckily we were running late that day for work and wasn't down there. And um, after everything happened, we, uh, my Elena, my girlfriend, uh, we were walking around just in a daze and, you know, for most of the day and uh, ended up going to around Union Square where the movie theater was open and playing movies for free. Uh, you could just walk in and watch a movie. 
and try to, I guess, get away from the chaos that was going on everywhere. And they were even giving away free water. It was a very generous time. <laughs> uh, and so we went in and watched this movie called Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which um, I, I knew nothing about it other than I knew it had been a musical and, and I was not a fan of musicals for the most part. And so this was a, an adaptation of a stage musical and it done as a movie. So we went in and watched it and, uh, and it blew me away. It was just, it was phenomenal. Personally, I just found it unbelievable. And uh, at the time, I remember thinking, wow, I didn't know musicals could be that way. Um, it was just this great rock score, a lot of kind of Bowie flavors to it and this outrageous story with all these crazy characters and pieces that somehow when you melted them together, they worked. And so fast forward ahead, you know, I guess that would have been 10 years ahead or so. And I remember thinking, I'm like, oh, hmm, maybe I should try writing a musical. So I came to another crossroads, another fork in the road. And uh, I, I, said, I was tossing around some ideas. And once again, my better half sends me a Yahoo link to one of the, a Yahoo story about uh, the New York Music Festival, which was uh, a, a new works uh, festival they held in, in New York City. And um, I had been, I had a, a friend of a friend who was a, a gay guy from Oklahoma who called himself Oklahoma. And I always thought that would make a great superhero name for whatever reason, I don't know why. And he was also a pretty big dude. And so um, I decided I was gonna, I'll write a musical called uh, Oklahoma Enforcer of Justice. Uh, with the tagline of oversized men and undersized spandex. And it was about this uh, gay couple superheroes. And I wrote it in about six months, barely seen a musical, I had no idea what I was doing and uh, submitted it. And it was accepted into this festival and, and did pretty well. Um, it ended up being sent off to a couple other festivals, had a few off-Broadway uh, little productions here and there. And, um, it never it made it to Broadway, obviously, but it did introduce me to this whole world where I started meeting people. And, uh, and, and again, was getting a lot of positive response from people in that industry. And it led to a, uh, 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 I was offered a two-year fellowship to NYU Tisch to write musical theater with um, a, a group of amazing professors and mentors all Broadway writers, and uh, for two years, at this point, I had quit my job, I should add. I was, and I had been quitting my job on and off throughout this whole saga of, I guess, 15 years or so. Uh, always welcome back with open arms to my legal professions, though, because I always left on good terms, and they were always super supportive of, of what I was trying to do. Um, but so at this point, I was fully unemployed and went and uh, did a two-year fellowship it was super intensive, wrote day and night, um, and just you know drowned in musical theater and learned it from the top to bottom. And I'm still not a great lover of a lot of musical theater, but I really came to appreciate uh, how hard a format it is to work and make work. And uh, and even the shows I'm not fans of, I, I can still see you know the craft and the quality that's gone into it. And so I've completed the two-year fellowship and um, got out of that and, and started writing the show that was mentioned early, earlier, um, Simon and Jorge pay their student loans, which uh, I spent about a year, a year and a half writing and was pretty sure that theaters probably would not be going for it because it's uh, broad comedy and, and that kind of tone of comedy. It's not really, there's not a lot of it out there in the theater world. Uh, Book of Mormon's, you know, it's such a great example. And for some reason, it's just not done very often. So I sent it out into the ether though, hoping someone might get what I got out of it. And, uh, and sure enough, probably the, the biggest, most competitive um, musical theater festival in the country, if not the world called National Alliance for Musical Theater um, and submitted it in 2019 and it was accepted. Um, they, I think they get hundreds or thousands of submissions each season and they pick eight shows and they do a reading with um, Broadway actors. So that involves 
uh, you get a week of rehearsal and, uh, and after that week you do two performances for hundreds of theater producers from around the country who are, um, it's only for industry professionals and, and other alumni of the festival and they come to Manhattan and watch uh, shows all day long for a few days. And uh, the actors, again, were just super talented, all from Broadway and Hollywood. And, um, and they learn half the show in a week. And then we do uh, a reading for all these producers. And that brings us to um, another video. Uh, this was, again, a little kind of promo video I put together after the festival um, for the show, Simon and Jorge pay their student loans. In life, we face many difficult, seemingly unanswerable questions. Why are we here? How does Wi-Fi work? And why has no one ever written a stoner bromance rock musical about the impending student loan crisis and ever widening income inequality gap? Well, ask no more. For I give you, Simon and Jorge pay their student loans. A new musical adventure written by me, Jesse Gage, about two BFFs and what happens when the American dream becomes the American nightmare. Hello! Have you two given any thought to your plans for after high school? Yeah, I'm gonna be a super famous DJ, you know. <laughs> and I'm gonna make the world a better place. Well, guess what? What? Cardell University offers majors in both DJing and making the world a better place. Woohoo! Let's go to college! And so, seven years later... The celebration doesn't last long, for Simon and Jorge soon find themselves working as baristas with their wages garnished for failing to pay their student loans. Our dynamic duo soon turns despondent, which is when Jorge's mother, Rosalita, steps in to offer some motherly advice. Your life is a sandwich, a stock between two slices of bread. The bottom slice you're born, and the top slice is when you're dead. Why be soggy and sad on the gas station shelf when you can wake up feeling glad that you made yourself so that you include the kind of food to be the dude that you would wish? Life is a sandwich. And so, feeling inspired, Simon convinces Jorge to go on a series of ill-advised and increasingly dangerous money-making endeavors, beginning with manufacturing crystal meth for the Russian mob and ending with selling their kidneys to Dr. Bob's medical office. But just as Dr. Bob is about to plunge in the scalpel, Jorge and his coworker Amy finally reveal their true feelings for each other. I would be sad if you... I would be sad if you... I would be sad if you... Simon is left alone on the operating table and the bromance in tatters. But when Jorge discovers Simon's in a coma and that his kidney has been misappropriated by a secret underground society of super rich people, he's finally had enough. I cannot go on with the way things are this time they After which they recover Simon's kidney, pay off their student loans, and finally bring some much needed justice to this world. And so that's, uh, we, we fin I finished the festival. Uh, the show did really well there. 
Um, and ultimately, I was approached by a commercial producer um, who's, who had had some pretty big successes previously on Broadway and off-Broadway, and um, he uh, wanted to option the show for Broadway. And this was, uh, let's see, in early 2020. And so once again, I'm like, wow, this looks like it's happening. We, we met at a, a pretty well-known restaurant in, in the theater district where they have, you know, the caricatures of all the actors and producers. And we're in the booth where his caricature is sitting next to his face. And I'm thinking, this is just surreal. Wow, that's crazy. It's, I, I never would have thought that this show would be the ticket that would finally get me uh, some, you know, you know, some of the success I'd always hoped for. And uh, so we signed the option. And then uh, about a week later, um, they shut down all the theaters, Broadway, off-Broadway, and we were in the COVID era. Uh, once again, a little disappointed, um, frustrated with uh, how the circumstances worked out. But, what, you know, we, we looked at uh, what we had as far as options. And so we decided uh, something we talked about, the producer and I had talked about before the theaters were even shut is pursuing screen-based options and uh, particularly animation. And that is how we come full circle to where I am today. And I connected back up with RIT and started uh, working with uh, the animation department here. And we were able to hire a couple illustrators uh, and they put together uh, a packet of, of illustrations that the producer is now shopping to a, ver a variety of content providers and um, getting positive responses so far, trying to sell it as, a, a, as a, an episodic sitcom, an animated musical episodic sitcom. And that is the final video, which uh, is a slideshow of the theme song um, for the hopefully soon to be uh, produced sitcom, Simon and Jorge pay their student loans, artwork by two uh, RIT graduate students. Best friends forever, that's how it's always been. We're together, through thick and thin. Yeah, whatever kind of trouble we're in. It's gonna be okay, cause we're Simon and Jorge. And that's the story of how I ended up here today <laughs> in 15 years and uh, in the 45 minutes. Great. If, uh, if anybody has questions, uh, definitely drop them in the Q&A box. Um, so I guess, Jesse, one of the questions uh, somebody has in the audience is, you know, thinking about your kind of entire career and, and where you are now, you know, what would you say is probably the one biggest lesson you've learned? Um, I think that, you know, if you don't make the F effort creates opportunity, you know, and, and, and it might not be the opportunity that you intended when you originally made the effort, <laughs> but it inevitably will lead to positive opportunities and experiences that won't happen if you don't try, you know, and trying to make a career in the arts is not, uh, it's not easy. And it's not something that you can really go into um, with the expectations of great success. You can hope for it, but you just have to really love the process. And I think that's some of my, probably my biggest lessons is I keep just trying and see where the roads take me. And it's made for one hell of a life, I'll tell you, I have not been bored. <laughs> Great. And how, how has your experience been working with the students kind of in this new endeavor of, you know, changing it into, into a cartoon? So they were great. They were, um, Haas Wheeler and, and Rachel Greenfeld were the graduate students. I think they are now graduated. I think they just finished this past spring. They, um, and I should add, they didn't, 
uh, we had the character drawings were actually done by an earlier illustrator that for a variety of reasons didn't work out. So they took those, those character drawings and then and it's, it was amazing the talents that they have. And then uh, we would give them the scene descriptions and they would come back with these hilarious, uh, really exciting uh, illustrations to kind of help bring it to life. Um, they were, it was all done remote, obviously, but it was pretty seamless. They were super professional and kudos to them and, and also MJ and Brian and, and the animation department. who We still keep in touch. I saw today finally in person for the first time. And I'm excited to hopefully continue, uh, you know, as, as I showed during this presentation, you know, now my latest kind of interest is animation. And even if wherever this goes, I'm really starting to think now about other directions to head in that format. So who knows? Great. And I know you mentioned, you know, you've been on, on campus today. You know, for those that haven't been back to campus, obviously a lot has changed. Kind of what's what's your impression of all the, the new and exciting things that are going on that you saw? Wow. Yeah, it has been a long time. I have not been here since I graduated, which is, uh, you know, well, 94. <laughs> so it, I can't even do the math. That's how long ago it was. Um, it was pretty unrecognizable in a lot of ways, in good ways. I mean, the, the, yeah, they've really added to the campus and the facilities. I love the fact that the arts have become such a, a prominent uh, and, and a, such a priority for what they're doing. I, I, I uh, met with some of that faculty today that's on, um, the, I guess it's performing arts. I'm gonna probably not give it the right title, but that they're incorporating these kind of minors to uh, to allow students to pursue, like I did with my life, they're pursuing one career path, but at the same time, continuing to develop these creative skills that may or may not lead to a career, but will certainly inevitably help them in whatever they do. I mean, it's the arts are just fundamentally important to, I think, as humans, I think, as a creator or a consumer. So I love that it's become uh, a part of the curriculum and, and was shocked when I originally was reached out to on LinkedIn. And again, as I said at the beginning, the fact that RIT is that somehow we, we, we cross paths again is a lovely surprise. Well, we really appreciate you um, putting this together for us. You know, I think people hopefully have learned a lot about kind of your life and your career path. And, you know, you've been kind of all over the place, which has been fun and trying new things. And, you know, we're really happy that, you know, things have kind of made that turn and you've been able to, you know, bring RIT back into your, your life as well. So. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I appreciate, and, you know, the invitation. It's always nice to, like I said, I'm not, I haven't made millions and I wasn't on the cover of Rolling Stone, but it's nice to, you know, remember some of the successes I have had. So looking back on this was really a positive experience for me as well. Well, that's great. So, and it was great to be able to see some of your, your past work and, and even <laughs> some of your, you know, your newer work that's kind of up and coming as well. So really appreciate you sharing that with us as well. Oh, thank you. So, so that's about all the time we have today. Uh, additional questions, if you have any for Jesse, can be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu. We'll direct your questions to Jesse and we'll get uh, the responses over to you. We hope that you've enjoyed tonight's webinar. We're working on plans for a bunch of other events coming up soon and hope you'll be able to join us for those as well. The link to those events can be found in the chat box as well. Uh, another event we have upcoming is the Saunders College of Business. We'll be holding a virtual live stream groundbreaking celebrating the college's expansion and renovation on August 31st at 4.45 p.m. and invite all of you to join. More info on the groundbreaking and the link to register can also be found in the chat box. Jesse, we appreciate you uh, doing this for us and are glad you could come back to campus uh, and inter interact with our students and hope you continue to do so. Thank you again, everybody for joining us. We hope you have a great night and we'll see you soon. Good night, everyone. <laughs>